Hello, BookTube. All right, this channel recently hit the staggering milestone of 5 million views. I called for questions. I got a bunch of them. So we're doing those, and this is part two. And we are up to Isaiah Armstrong. Congrats to Steve and the Bean. Uh, what do you think of Huckleberry Finn as a novel? Do you think it is worth the veneration or criticism that it gets? What is your opinion of the controversial ending? Uh, it's an, a lopsided, imperfect novel. You only have to weigh it against the novels that weren't by Twain. You don't have to weigh it against anything else, just his own work. Uh, but the parts of it that are effective are tremendously effective. I don't really care. The ending is notoriously a mess, and the, the middle part. The, the, it, it goes off the rails. I don't think it ever really gets back on the rails. And uh, the sort of last-minute tonal change, I, it's I, I, I like it, but I don't venerate it the way that it's venerated. I also don't criticize it the way it's criticized. You know, I'm, I'm amazed that it is still taught in schools. It has the N-word, which we're not even allowed to say. This video would be taken down by YouTube in about a fraction of a second if I even said the word. Um, <laughs> so I'm amazed. It's, there are, it's, in, it's in Huck Finn 100,000 times. But I, I, I've never understood it. I've never understood why... If you're going to venerate Mark Twain, I guess I understand because it touches the live wire of, of race, of the issue of race, so that it can be, uh, what, a teachable text. Uh, but in terms of, that seems to lead Mark Twain, the writer, right out of the equation. And I don't like that. I would rather, if you want to include Mark Twain, the canonical writer, not the canonical race writer, but the canonical writer, if you want to include him in a class unit or something, I've always thought it's a better idea to just assign five short stories that that usually are thematically clean and very powerful and very funny and very good uh also what are your thoughts on philip pullman is his dark material series worth reading yes it is uh jess bragg says technical difficulties aside i've really enjoyed the live streams you've done so far yes i have been uh gently nudged gently notified via email many many times in the last week that it has been way too long since i did a live stream and that we know it works, and that we know it's a lot of fun. I, 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 I totally agree. I hear that completely, and it's just a matter of getting used to doing it regularly. That's all. Uh, let's see here. A big part of that is your obvious enjoyment of interacting with subscribers. You see? Well, the reason why I thank you for that, but the reason why is because I don't think that way. I don't think of it that way. I'm not interacting with subscribers. I'm talking with friends. I honestly do think that that is not just uh, if you heard that from a big YouTuber who was heavily monetizing their channel, then they would be telling you that lying to you about that specifically in order to strengthen the parasocial relationship that makes them $15,000 a month. I don't monetize my channel and I don't want to. And I'm not when I say it, I actually mean it. I actually mean it. And that's what I feel like. I feel like I'm talking to a group of friends. Oh, the live streams bring that out hugely. Uh, I think you mentioned movie reviews such as Dune would be rare, but if you're still getting the occasional preview screener, oh my, I'm getting tons of preview screeners, not just the occasional one, I'm getting one for everything, uh, for movies or TV, would think capsule reviews would be perfect for a live session. I'll leave the question to others this time, but a virtual high five for five million. <laughs> he goes, well, I've also got that in emails many times from many people uh, saying, if you do get screeners of stuff, if you're on the list to get screeners from, of stuff, then why don't you talk about it? I mean, good God. I, I, I always say, you know, I like to keep the emphasis on books, but how often do I spend time talking about things that aren't books on this channel? Plenty of time. I could do that. Uh, I, for instance, uh, uh, I must have, must be three dozen uh, people who've emailed me saying, I'm pretty sure you got the screener for the first five episodes of Moon Knight. I'd love to know what you think of it. Since you've read your Marvel comics from the very beginning, you're going to be more knowledgeable than any of the movie bros that I watch. Surely you saw it, so what did you think? I, a number of people have said, I'm sure you got a screener of Morbius. What did you think of it? And, uh, and there's also a movie that I got a screener for, and I've watched it a few times now, and it's no one's requested it of me, probably because of my, my off-stated opinions of the books, uh, the Harry Potter books. Uh, but the new uh, Fantastic Beast movie, uh, what is it, the, the Legacy of Dumbledore or Dumbledore's Army or something like that, uh, with Jude Law is incredibly good. It's just incredibly good. I haven't heard any advance new notice about this thing at all. And I, God knows the movie bro channels have been totally caught up in the culture wars. So they don't even look at the movies anymore. They look at what side they're supposed to be on. Most of them. Uh, so I don't know how many of them will even mention 
it's head and shoulders better than the last Fantastic Beast movie. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It had pathos. The special effects looked fantastic. And it also had serious emotional beats to it. I don't know what caused it. I really don't know what caused it. I have a theory. I watched it the second time that I watched it. I had a theory. Is why is this resonating so much better than the other Fantastic Beast movies? I have a theory. <laughs> so I think I have often noticed it to be true, both in live theater and also in movies, that the performance that you'll get out of an actor is sometimes dictated by how good the other actors are. Sometimes you will get a better performance out of a good actor if they're around a, a very good other actor. And the, the the opposing leads in this movie, I mean, there are heartthrobs. Ezra Miller is in this movie as a heartthrob. He does a great job, a better job than he's done before. Uh, I think Hollywood is missing a uh, what in the last week has become a very obvious casting choice, which is make him villains. <laughs> Cast him as the villain. He's very good at it. Uh, and also uh, the aforementioned Eddie Redmayne is in this. They're the two competing male heartthrobs. Uh, but the the opponents here are Jude Law, who's ten times better than he was in the last movie, and Mads Mikkelsen, who takes over for Johnny Depp, and he's ten times better an actor than Johnny Depp. I can't help but think that's not a coincidence, that that, that raised the level of the movie. I certainly, I certainly thought it did. Oh, oh, boy. If you were unimpressed by the last few, the last two Fantastic Beast movies, and you're thinking, okay, I pretty much, I pretty much have the measure of this series. Don't miss the third one. <laughs> That's all I have to say. But anyway, obviously, I have a lot to say on the screeners that I get. Uh, so let's move on here. Jasper Antonelli has a barrage of questions. What a surprise! Uh, number one, because Shakespeare is so important, what plays of his in particular, aside from the, the obvious Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, Julius Caesar, Othello, and Midsummer? Uh, you're not on Twitter. You can say the whole Midsummer Night's Dream, and you also left out King Lear. <laughs> You left out King Lear. Uh, deserve to be read and reread more than others. Well, your list is fine. Uh, uh, all of Shakespeare's major work deserves to be read and reread and watched, especially watched. Keep an eye out for when you can see them live, any of them live. Uh, number two, do you think you miss anything in your reading enjoyment by reading so quickly? Uh, you have mentioned this year has been unsatisfying. Do you ever consider the problem? I know you're infallible. Could be your method. I reread. I fly through things, yes. I, I am very conscious of the ticking of the clock, but I reread as well. New releases included. I, like, for instance, it's built into my program. I get an advanced copy. I read that usually uh, pretty fast. And then I get a finished copy. That's my goal to reread the book. That's my prompt to read the thing again. Uh, I've had this question many times, including before there was a book tube. Uh, is the speed with which you read decreasing your enjoyment? My answer in the pre-internet days and now is the same. Do I strike you as someone who doesn't enjoy reading? <laughs> don't think I do. Uh, no, I don't think it affects what I do. Uh, and number three, when approaching an author you have never heard of and reading through them, do you prefer to read uh, his major works or read through his works chronologically? Uh, well, I... <laughs> the, the super pretentious answer is that this has never happened to me. <laughs> if it's a new author, then I am perforce reading their works chronologically. But a major author? Well, I guess maybe it's happened to me that I've read the major works first, and then if I really like the author, I've gone back and read the, ma the minor ones. But uh, no, I, I, uh, it, it isn't a doctrinal thing either way. Usually the, ma the, the canonical authors that I've read and really liked or even the semi-canonical authors, I've usually been exposed to them by their major works. And then if I really like them, I go back and read the minor works. And everybody else, all, all the authors who are currently carving out careers, I'm following those careers chronologically because of my job. <laughs> uh, I hope that answers the question. I'm not sure that I got that question. Uh, Taking Tea with Catherine says, Hi, I was thinking recently about books slash movies that have a quirky or whimsical portrayal of bookshops. And how... When I come across this, I fantasize about working in such a place. Well, why wouldn't you? The way they're portrayed in movies and TV, why wouldn't you fantasize about it? Uh, does having, excuse me, does having experience of real-world book selling ruin that kind of fantasy for you, is, or is there still room for that dream? Well, there's room for the dream, but I can scorn it now <laughs> in a way that I couldn't before, because working in an actual bookstore is nothing like it's portrayed in You've Got Mail or anything else. Nothing like it. And also... It's also nothing like it's portrayed in the super cynical version where it's hell on earth. It, it's just, 
It's not, not, it's not anything like either one of those things. It, it always reminds me whenever people ask this kind of question or this kind of subject comes up, I always remember uh, a dear, a dear guy named John who used to run a store here in Boston, a little gay bookstore called Glad Day Bookshop. And one day he was, he was a curmudgeon anyway, very sharp tongue, very, very smart, very wonderful guy, a heart of, a heart of, of gold underneath that crusty exterior. Uh, and one day he was in his shop and the, these two adorable, this, this, these two men, these two adorable old queens, obviously been a couple since before Stonewall. And they came in and were just sort of idly browsing and they were chatting with each other. They weren't trying to get his goat, but it was never very hard to get his goat. And the, one of them said to the other, oh, you know, dear, when we retire, we should open a little shop like this. Wouldn't it be fun? And John used to get comedy gold out of that for years going on about, about slipping in urine in the alley with rat intestines in order to wrestle boxes off the Ingram delivery. <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and that's the, that's a large part of the reality. So I, I uh, no, there's still room for the dream. Of course. I still dream myself. I daydream about it all the time. It's totally unrealistic. But imagine, imagine a little bookstore, not much bigger than this room that had a cash register and maybe a cat and, uh, that had a good, active, well-chosen selection of new releases and maybe a basement of used books that was also well-curated and we're always buying. I imagine a bookstore like that and then populate it with people from BookTube that you already know. Wouldn't you want a bookstore like that in your neighborhood where you, if you walked in the door and the bell rang over the door, you knew that you were going to find me and Deb behind the counter just chatting about books? Wouldn't you want such a place? Yeah, that's a great fantasy. It's just it would never in a million years happen. Uh, let's see here. Jesse says, this is so awesome. Congratulations. You're one of my favorite channels. One of? Okay, we're going to let that go. Uh, and have inspired me to read and write more through the years. Well, maybe you'd get even more inspiration if you weren't watching all the other losers that you apparently watch. Just keep in mind, they're all losers except me. <laughs> uh, do you have any writing advice that is often missed or not discussed, but is important. You're trying to get me going, aren't you, Jesse? You're trying to get me going. First with this one of my favorite channels business. Uh, and now, do I have any extra writing advice? Let me ask you a question. We're not, it's not a two-way conversation here, but if you're honest, you'll give the answer right to the screen. Have you written today? Do you want to write? Have you written today? Did you write yesterday? Do you have a project currently under works and do you set aside time to work on it every day? I think we both know the answer to those questions and that means you don't need any more writing advice. <laughs> the basic piece of writing advice is the place to start, which is that you should write. All the rest of the advice can wait until you're actually doing it. <sighs> you're upsetting the baby. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, <laughs> This ought, to, this ought to stop all Q&As from happening in the future. Uh, Nicole F. says, Congratulations. Thank you for your regular rants, weather updates, and book info. They make my day happier. Well, that's wonderful. It makes my day happier, too. Uh, quick question. Since you, your hearing is much more than normal, do you hear yourself differently when you speak? Oh, no, it doesn't work that way. I'm the same boat as the rest of you. I don't. I cannot possibly modulate my own voice. Not at all. It still does. I don't think I'd recognize my voice if I heard it, even though I've made... 5,000 videos. I still don't think I would. Uh, Anthony Hodges says, Steve, I would like to thank you for all the recommendations and reviews, particularly for introducing me to the works of the late John O'Hara. Oh my, wonderful. What are your thoughts on Chuck Palahniuk? He stinks. Uh, have you read Henry Williamson's series, A Chronicle of Ancient Sunlight? If so, what is your view of it? Uh, okay, well, I was about to jump down your throat for asking a have you read question, but I haven't read this book. Uh, or a series. I, I don't know anything about it. I'll have to look it up. Uh, Alan Black has a barrage of questions. Number one, of the three major Bronte sister novels, Jane Eyre, Wuthering Heights, and Tenet of Wildfell Hall, which is your favorite and why? Uh, it'd be Jane Eyre. Uh, I just think it, it just flashes along. I love it. Uh, number two, do you have a favorite Icelandic saga? If so, what one and why? It changes. Every time Saga Long comes around on BookTube, I have a new favorite, and then it changes. So, no, I don't have a fixed favorite. Uh, number three, I've just finished The King of Elfland's Daughter by Lord Dunsany. I loved it. Thanks for the recommendation. Oh, I love hearing that my recommendations landed. Wonderful. 
Uh, let's see here. Read by Fred. Another BookTube channel. You should all go and subscribe. Uh, five million views. Congratulations. You've been posting BookTube videos for around six years and have created over 5,000 videos. Is it over 5,000? I haven't checked. That's another occasion for Q&A. <laughs> uh, so you've seen how BookTube has evolved. I have two questions I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Number one, was BookTube different when you first started compared to today? If so, what are some of the differences you've noticed? Well, yeah, six years ago, BookTube was still largely YA. It was still largely dominated by YA. And the biggest channels are stupid, brainless, openly deceitful, over-polished, fairy lights, hyper-monetized, hyper-sponsored YA channels done by bourbon-binging 30-somethings who don't read. So, so that kind of success very much still pays, unfortunately. I hate to say it, but it still does. That's a, if you come to BookTube and you want to make money, uh, first of all, shame on you. But second, if you want to do that, that model still works. But in the years that have intervened, look at how many other voices have appeared talking about all kinds of things. And they don't stay at 30 subscribers. They, those channels grow. They, I firmly believe, like, for instance, take an, take an example, um, Codex Cantina, the guys at Codex Cantina, have a nice, big, healthy subscriber count. Not that that means anything. They also pour their heart and soul into what they're doing. And there would have been no ground for them six years ago. They wouldn't, they would have been a complete anomaly six years ago. Uh, what I wanted, what I talked about six years ago on BookTube was that BookTube start to resemble more closely the incredible variety of readers and reading material that is out there in the reading world that you encounter among other readers. A section of YouTube devoted to books and reading ought to look like that world, and it much closer does. That certainly has changed. Uh, number two, what helps you maintain your drive to continue with BookTube? <laughs> is it a drive? I don't think I'm I don't think I'm enough of a dude, bro, to have a drive. I don't have a huge analog watch. <laughs> Uh, no, it's it's not. I don't think it's a drive. It's just that I like talking to my imaginary booktube friends. I like doing it. If I if a day goes by when I don't do that, I really miss it. Um, so I, it, if that's a drive, it's certainly a good one because it's totally organic. It's totally sincere. Uh, let's see here. Chrisam seventy says, "Congratulations! You have you may have answered this in the past, but number one, when did you realize that you wanted a career in literature, writing, teaching, critiquing, editor, etc." It just seemed to flow naturally from being introduced to books. From I, I was introduced to the love of books and reading late. And it seemed to flow naturally from there. All of the things that you mentioned are things that I have done. Uh, or I'm still doing. And it, it just seemed natural that if I love something so much and it is so all-encompassing, that I wouldn't want to do anything else with my time. And sooner or later you have to start earning money with what you do with your time. And I, it just it was a natural progression. Um, number two, what two or three books would you recommend for Nordic literature? I uh, have no idea. First, I'd want a definition of the term, uh, and then what kind of books. Uh, no idea. Uh, yeah, I'd, need, I'd need specifics on, on that. Uh, let's see here. Foothill Element says, Hi, Steve. We're all happy to see you. I bet many of those five million viewers tuned in for Frida, don't you? She's such a charmer. She is. Probably that's the reason. Uh, number two, will you please, or number one, will you please speak about Martha Grimes and her mysteries? They're very good. They're solid stuff. Uh, and number two, should we start with Richard Jury series or one of her standalone mysteries? It doesn't matter. She's not noticeably better in any one or the other. Uh, you, if you're going to start with, uh, with a, any book and series for her, you definitely want to start at the beginning, which is, oh my God, I've completely forgotten the first Richard Jury book. Is it, uh, is it? Bell and Bladebone, or I Am the Only Running Footman. I don't remember. I don't remember the first Richard Jury book. But if you're going to read them, if you want to start, if you want to concentrate on her series, definitely start at the beginning. Uh, the Wikipedia entry will tell you what the first book is. Uh, and number three, what other similar mystery series would you recommend, P.D. James? If you're if you're thinking about Martha Grimes, then if you haven't read P.D. James, read P.D. James. Uh, also, Ruth Randall is. I know these are big, familiar names, but they're that way for a reason. Uh, the Wexford Mysteries by Rendell are rereadable. They're so good. And there are plenty of others. I mean, there's uh, Patricia Wentworth, the Miss Silver books. There's uh, uh, Nio Marsh, the Inspector Allen novels. These are, these are all absolutely terrific. These ladies defined a genre, and the stuff is fantastic. Uh, let's see here. Michael Lombardo says, Steve, my... Oh, I just remembered that if I'm, if I'm resting this iPad on the computer... 
it's going to make a huge noise on the audio. Sorry about that. Here, let's let's put this away somewhere. Uh, the audio is bad enough on this channel as it is, without making it worse. Michael Lombardo says, Steve, my local library has a section of donated and withdrawn books for sale. Wish mine did. <laughs> I wish mine did. The Boston Public Library has a book sale, but it doesn't have a continuing book sale, an ongoing one. Uh, let's see here. Browsing the shelves, I came across a Penguin softcover, the complete Saki. Oh, which one did you see? Did you see the one with the pale green spine? Yeah. Uh, who is he? If you ever read this author, cue the look of displeasure I call the Steve Shriveler. Well, you're not, you're asking if, you're not saying have you ever read, you're close to a Steve Shriveler. <laughs> I have read, I have read Saki, yes. Uh, I don't recall mentioning a video. Well, I can't mention everybody, <laughs> can I, right? Uh, but uh, Saki is, uh, was an English author, H.H. H. Monroe. And he wrote, he wrote, you know, stereotypically revered short stories that collected Saki will give you lots and lots of enjoyable reading. I don't have that at the moment. As far as I know, that collected Saki used to be in the Penguin Modern Classics. I don't think it was ever made into a Penguin Black Spine Classic in America anyway. And I don't have the, the Green Spine or anything else. I think I only have a collection of Saki as an ebook of a Penguin Modern Classics, uh, which is not nearly as big. Uh, but he's worth your time, definitely. Uh, let's see here. Alan Black says, sorry, another question. I am in the middle of reading Dancer from the Dance by Andrew Holleran. I have been enjoying it immensely, finding it beautifully written, humorous, and very flowing and easy to read. What are your thoughts on this book? I love it. I agree with your thoughts entirely. It's a, it's a classic of gay literature. Uh, I-D-I-C Warrior, infinite diversity in infinite combinations. Uh, reads, says, hello, Steve. Congrats on the latest milestone, y'all. <laughs> what? what would your recommendation be for a great Joyce Carol Oates novel? Uh, well, I like Belle Fleur, but also Blonde would work really well. Also for Marilyn Robinson, with Marilyn Robinson, start with housekeeping. Definitely. Uh, Claire Shepard says, I am fond of Greek and Roman history. I would like to learn more. I would be so pleased if you could suggest some Greek drama to read. Thank you. Well done on the huge amount of views. Uh, well, it's a big subject, but if, you've, if you're brand new, read introductions. Read about Greek drama as much as you can, and then start with Euripides. I know... He's typically third in line, Aeschylus, then Sophocles, then Euripides. But Euripides is the one who's inching closer to our modern sense of drama, of, of what drama is. So I, start with Euripides. Start with something of his. The Hippolytus is usually the place to go, or the Medea. Uh, let's see here. John Stanley says, your videos likely are the best things on YouTube. You're not the first person I've heard that from, and I do not understand that at all. Uh, three questions. Number one, in a recent tag, you said no horror story is important to you, but you all, all have also said Dracula is one of your favorite novels. Please explain the mental gymnastics. Oh, you're right, aren't you? I guess Dracula is widely considered an, an archetypal horror novel. It doesn't scare me, but it is very important to me, so I guess I gave short shrift to that. I should have included Dracula. You're right. I also love Frankenstein. Uh uh, let's see here. Number two, have you any guilty pleasures in the sense of novelists or writers generally who consider objectively bad, but who enjoy reading? Uh, well, Meg, that would be Steve Alton's Meg novels about a giant albino 60 foot prehistoric killer shark. I think there's a strong case to be made. I've probably made that case myself that they are objectively bad, but oh my, <laughs> they are the guiltiest of guilty pleasures. I wouldn't miss one. Uh, then number three, can you think of any writers you consider objectively excellent, but who you simply don't enjoy reading? How long have you got? Uh, if you can think of any, can you put your finger on what it is about their writing that puts you off? Uh, well, I can think of, I mean, think of some towering figures. There's Proust, obviously, the subject of our uh, Proust June uh, read-along. There's Goethe, widely considered one of the greatest writers in human history. Uh, Dickens, Charles Dickens, for God's sake, is <laughs> usually universally renowned. And they do, their writings just, I recognize the formal worth, but they just don't do it for me. And my nearest explanation for what they're doing wrong is that they're not American. <laughs> uh, John, John Voto says, hi, Steve, congratulations on 5 million views. Sorry for this downer of a question. You seem as pessimistic or realistic as I am about the future of American democracy. The midterms are eight months away. We have eight months left. Uh, not to turn things around. Things can't be turned around. They're the election officials who will ratify the election results in the battleground states that are up for grabs uh, have are in position now and have taken their positions on the explicit promise that a Democrat will not win. Uh, eight months, that's all. 
Uh, anyway, <laughs> you have a question. How do you stay so happy? How have you avoided becoming a miserable cynic? Uh, the, the automatic answer that I want to give, the answer that I always give to this kind of question is that it's a canine thing. I am, I am in, not genetically, <laughs> but, it, but in terms of so, social upbringing, I'm far more canine than human. And dogs are very good at being happy, no matter what. No matter what their circumstances are there. But also, if we were to shift into chin-stroking do-bro mode, I would also say, what good does it do to be miserable? Even about miserable news, what good does it do? Don't you prefer to be happy? Don't you have in your immediate circumstances, for now, eight months away, for now, in your immediate circumstances, don't you have mostly reasons to be happy? Don't you mostly have your health? Mostly have your mental acuity? Uh, mostly have free time to read and write and watch my endless videos <laughs> in your immediate circumstances if you were being completely self-absorbed which i warned you about because we're in do bro uh, is, don't you have reason to be happy around you regardless of what the outside world is saying or doing you do i would argue that you do i would argue that you have a huge amount of reason to be happy well then you should probably be happy what good does it do for you to be miserable about what's happening in washington or ukraine Concerned, yes. Miserable from time to time, yes. But there's only one you, and you only get one life, and it's ending quickly. <laughs> You're aging quickly. So I, I guess maybe that's my dude bro answer. I think the ultimate answer here is neither canine nor dude bro, which is just that I'm a happy person. I'm just by nature a happy person. I, I revert, I tend to revert to joking happiness no matter what's going on in my own life, no matter what things I might be legitimately upset about. Uh, if, if I, if I, if there's horrible news all week long, dark, horrible news, and I'm really upset about all of it, and you come over here for wine and calzones, we are not going to be sitting in misery. We're going to be laughing our asses off is what we're going to be doing. And, I, and, and that is just, I think, my nature. I think that's just my nature. Uh, let's see here. Matt Sheridan, how are we doing? All right, let's do Matt Sheridan's questions. Congrats on 5 mil, Donahue. Next up is 15K subscribers, then 20K. This channel is never getting to 20K subscribers. Question number one, what are your thoughts on the 1619 project? <laughs> nice try. <laughs> uh, number two, how is it possible that Harold Bloom enjoyed Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy? He did not. He did not. Uh, okay, so uh, let's stop at Matt Sheridan and we'll move on uh, to part three.